Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining our discussion today. My name is Mike Furstenberg, and I will serve as your moderator for today's webinar. In keeping with our usual standard practice, all participant lines are muted. Uh, this is to ensure the best possible experience for everyone. Uh, we do still hope for your participation, so please do enter your questions into the questions box of the GoToWebinar panel at any time. And we will address all of these submitted questions at the end of the presentation. Feel free to uh, use the chat window to communicate with the organizers and presenters if you are having technical challenges with the interface. As, an, as a note, uh, because it is the most often asked question, yes, all webinar re registrants will receive a follow-up email, which will include information on how to access a recorded version of this webinar. Today's webinar topic is 13 Ways Through a Firewall. It's new and updated, presented by Andrew Ginter. Andrew Ginter is the VP of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. He's written two books on industrial security. He's the co-author of the Industrial Internet Consortium Security Framework. He co-hosts the Industrial Security Podcast. He's a lecturer for the Industrial Security Institute. And of course, he contributes frequently to industrial security standards and best practice guidance. Andrew spent 20 years developing control systems and IPOT middleware. He then led the development of the world's first industrial sim as the chief technology officer at Industrial Defender. And today he leads a team of experts at Waterfall who work with the world's most secure industrial sites. So without further ado, here's Andrew with 13 ways to break a firewall. Very good, thank you, Mike. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my topic today is a, a refresh on the classic 2012 paper that uh, that had the same name. Um, you know, in the decade in between, firewalls haven't changed that much. Uh, the threat environment has. And so anyone familiar with the original paper is gonna see a couple of the, the, the same attacks mentioned here with, of course, modern examples, but a lot of these attacks are entirely new. I mean, the old attacks still work, but sort of the emphasis the, uh, has changed, certainly among attackers and uh, to an extent among defenders, trying to understand what's coming after us and, and what do we have to do about it. Um, before we dive into the attacks, let's spend a few words uh, on uh, terminology. Um, you know, what is a firewall? Let's start out, you know, with the basics. What is the internet? You know, terminology-wise, really, the Internet's got kind of three pieces. It's got hosts, it's got routers, and it's got connections. Uh, you know, the uh, the connections are fiber, they're uh, wire, they're wireless. They are what connect the hosts and the routers to each other. Uh, the hosts are where messages, Internet protocol messages, start and where they end. They're sort of the end points of the conversation. And the routers forward network packets they forward traffic from one network to another they look at each message and they say what's the ip address where's this message going which of my connections should i send the the the, the message down so that's terminology wise sort of the the simple model of the internet what's a firewall in that terminology a firewall is a router firewalls forward network traffic from from one network to another they look at each message and say where's it going and send it down the right wire firewalls are routers with filters um, the filters are software. The software looks at every message that comes by and asks the question, is this message allowed? If it's allowed, it hands the message to the router portion of the firewall, and the router sends the message where it's going. If the message is not allowed, we drop the message. So, um, you know, that's terminology-wise. Now, our focus here is industrial networks. Um, in industrial networks, uh, there's firewalls, inside the industrial network there's firewalls inside the enterprise network uh, but there's one very important firewall that most people think a lot about and that's the firewall at the itot interface and the reason for the concern is that the itot interface is the boundary between two very different kinds of networks 
uh, you know, the industrial network is control critical. The computers on that network control powerful physical devices. Fundamentally, every tool is also a weapon. The more powerful the tool, the more powerful the weapon. And these industrial computers are controlling some very powerful tools as a rule. Enterprise networks, they're important still. They're business critical. They're not control critical. They're not safety critical. They're not equipment critical. They're business critical. And so um, what a lot of people are asking, sort of, you know, a lot of authorities are issuing advice saying, you know, maybe it doesn't really make sense to drop a firewall at the interface between these two very different kinds of networks. You know, what we need is something stronger. Um, and oh, here we are. Um, and, you know, when I say something stronger, it's something stronger than software. I mean, people look at a firewall, you see a box, you imagine the, the firewall is hardware. In fact, if you take your screwdriver out, you open up the box, what's inside? It's a CPU. Firewalls are, are software. The CPU runs software. Um, what's the alternative? An alternative I'm going to talk about is called a unidirectional security gateway. A unidirectional security gateway is very simple. It is a combination of both hardware and software. Um, you know, the hardware is physically able to send information in only one direction, and the software takes snapshots of industrial data pushes it through the strange one-way hardware and makes that data available to the business so that the business can profit from access to the, to the industrial data. And so the interdirectional gateway is both hardware and software. In a sense, the hardware is what saves us. It physically can send information in only one direction. And uh, the most common place, the single most common place to deploy these gateways is at this very sensitive ITOT interface between the two networks at different levels of criticality. So for each of the attacks I'm coming to, I'm going to talk at length about how the attack gets through a firewall, but I'm also going to mention what the attack does when it hits the unidirectional gateway. So that brings us to attack number one. Uh, in a sense, stealing passwords is the oldest trick in the book. What's depressing is that it still works. Um, steal the firewall password, log in as the administrator, add a rule that says allow everything, and now the firewall isn't a firewall anymore, it's just a router. It forwards everything, no protection. Uh, the single most common way to steal a password nowadays is phishing, phishing and spear phishing. So for example, and I, you know, I promised you some examples, Google Bank of America phishing 2020, um, there was a serious phishing attack that targeted the Bank of America recently, stole thousands of passwords, targeted tens of thousands of, of Bank of America customers. Um, you know, how did it work? Email went out saying, you need to update your email address on your Bank of America account. The emails were very convincing. They were professionally formatted. They, you know, they, they looked like they came from the Bank of America. When you click on the email saying, let me update my password, it goes to a domain name that looks a lot like the Bank of America domain name. You get to a website that has all the right logos, it has all the right look and feel, it looks like the real thing. You say log in and it's even asking you what's your password because it's stealing your password right here. And then it says okay that's the right password but I'm still not sure I believe you. You know here are your secret questions. Answer the secret questions. Prove that you are who you say you are. And of course it's harvesting the answers to your secret questions. Very convincing pulled in a lot of people. There's other ways to steal passwords. You know, you can shoulder surf, an insider can look over the shoulder of somebody else uh, as they're entering a password. Uh, you know, you can pick up the phone, you can weave a tale of, whoa, whoa, whoa is me, I need a password, I can't get my job done, people are so mean to me, can I have a password? And you know, more than half the time, the well-meaning individual on the other side of the phone will either give you a password or just create a whole new account for you. Social engineering. And you know, the, the depressing way to, to, to steal a password is, you know, don't even steal one. Just read the documentation or, you know, read the vulnerability report. There's a hard-coded password, you know, uh, CVE 2020-3330 uh, uh, was, you know, hard-coded passwords 
in the Cisco wireless firewalls, wireless VPN firewalls. It's a VPN, it's encrypted, it must be secure unless, unless there's a hard-coded password, then, well, you're sunk. Um, and if there's a unidirectional gateway instead of a firewall, well, it doesn't matter if you steal the password to the software. It doesn't matter if you steal a password to all of the computers on the industrial network. There's physically no way to send those passwords into the industrial network. The hardware won't send the information into the network. If you can't send the password in, you can't use it against the industrial network. So that was passwords. Um, you know, in the 2012 version of the 13 ways, um, this management tool topic was called hacking Active Directory because Active Directory was sort of the management tool that everybody used back in the day. Today, there's all sorts of management tools in use. Um, you know, in the in the Active Directory example, it was you know steal a hash, steal a ticket, steal a golden ticket, whatever the terminology is. Uh, get control of the Active Directory controller, create yourself a new account, give that account universal access privileges, and now you don't need to steal passwords anymore. You can log into the firewall, you can say, change the rules, if the firewall's on the domain. If the firewall's not on the domain, log into the historian or the OPC server or the file server or whatever is behind the firewall with an interface exposed to the, the enterprise network, you know, log in with your password, and just do things. You've exploited permissions, not vulnerabilities. Um, but nowadays, it's not just Active Directory controllers. You have a lot of management tools to choose from. Um, you might use the, you know, the SolarWinds Orion is a management tool for firewalls. Um, if you break into Orion, you can change everything. And this was one of the big deals with. Uh, you know, the SolarWinds Orion breach. And the SolarWinds Orion, I'm gonna talk more about later. It was not primarily a breach of the Orion system, someone using the Orion system against the world. It was malware embedded in a security update for the management system. But when people started looking hard at Orion because of all of this supply chain stuff, they discovered a bunch of vulnerabilities. There was two vulnerabilities published in the, the weeks after the Orion breach. One of them was uh, 25275. Um, and it was a way to break into the Orion management system. If you get into the management system, you can tell every firewall in the in the the organization allow all. It's that kind of thing. If you break into the management system, you know a lot of vendors, industrial vendors, have management systems for their control systems. You break into the management system for the control system, and you can say, apply these security updates. Don't apply those security updates. Install this software, install this ransomware on all your plants simultaneously. You can say that to the control system management system and it'll just do it if you can get in. So these management tools are targets. Um, you know, industrial security best practice says do not deploy these single points of compromise. Do not connect anything on the industrial network don't, do not make them depend, do not make them trust systems, management systems or otherwise, on the enterprise network. Have separate management systems for your industrial networks, you know, so that you don't have these single points of compromise on the enterprise network for all of your systems at once. Now, uh, that's firewalls. You know, firewalls are configured to allow these trust relationships. This is the problem. When you've got an ITOT interface that's a unidirectional gateway, what have you got? Well, then it doesn't matter how many management systems are on the enterprise network. It doesn't matter how many of them are compromised. Nothing gets back into the industrial network. It just doesn't work. And so, um, you know, in a sense, putting a unidirectional gateway at the ITOT interface um, requires you to apply this bit of industrial security best practice and put a proper management system in place for the industrial network separate from the management system for the enterprise network. And you know, I wanted to take this uh, a minute to, to digress and talk about return on investment. When I tell people they should really be using a separate management infrastructure for their industrial wide area network versus their enterprise wide area network, you know, a lot of them look at me and say, yeah, but that would, I can't do that. That would double the cost of my management system. You know, how can this possibly be justified? Well, let's look at the ROI calculation. Let's do it right. 
you know, the right way to do the calculation is not say, hey, my cost doubled, any questions? That's not the right way to do the calculation. What you do is you look at your costs, you look at your benefits, you look at your savings and your efficiencies. How much did I spend? How much did I save? So the right way to do it is to say, let's say we have, I don't know, 10,000 devices, um, you know, 10,000 hosts, 10,000 firewalls, 10,000 things we're managing in a large network. If I have to make a policy change on every one of those devices, I got to do something to every one of those devices. If I do it manually, it's going to cost me 10,000 times visiting the device and making the change. If I have a management system, I can go into that management system and once make the change and press the button that says push it out to all 10,000 devices. What's my savings? You know, instead of doing something 10,000 times, I've done it once. I've saved 99.99% of my effort. Uh, but I've introduced cybersecurity risk. Now, what's the cost if we have two management systems, or let's say 10 management systems, you know, one for each of, of nine factories and one for the, the enterprise, 10 management systems. We still have 10,000 devices. Uh, if we have to make the same change, now instead of visiting 10,000 devices, we have to visit 10 devices. And so our savings is only 99.9%. We've still saved an enormous amount of effort. The management system still pays for itself. What's the difference between the two scenarios? It's less than one-tenth of one percent. That's the difference in savings. We're saving an enormous amount of money in both scenarios. What's the difference in risk? We've accepted a huge cybersecurity risk by having a single management system, a single point of compromise on the enterprise network. So when you look at it this way, the difference is less than 0.1% in terms of the, the savings, and the risk reduction is dramatic by having a separate management system on the, on the industrial network. You know, we do these calculations routinely for safety systems. You know, if we put in a, a million dollar automation system, uh, you know, hardware, software, installation, testing, everything, that's the, the cost of the, the, the upgrade to our automation system. And we said, you know, I could save $50,000 if I just dropped all the safety gear and didn't have any safety systems. You know, that would be a savings of one half of 1%. Would we do that? No. Nobody risks the lives of the people at the plant for a one half of 1%, you know, savings. So do the cost benefit correctly. And, you know, it makes sense to have two management systems, one for business critical, one for control critical networks. Okay, attack number three. Um, Attacking through the firewall. Again, this is an old one. It's one of the originals. All I've changed is the examples. Remember, firewalls fundamentally are routers. They forward network traffic. If we can trick the filter function into thinking that a, an attack packet is allowed, the firewall happily forwards that packet full of attacks right into our protected network. Examples are everywhere. Uh, you know, one of the most famous a few years ago was Shellshock. Now, this was a, a, this was like six years ago. Uh, it was a vulnerability in the Linux Bash shell. It affected most of the world's Linux servers, uh, and most of the world's web servers run on Linux. So it affected most of the world's web servers. You send a packet, you send a, a couple of packets with the HTTP request with this attack in it into the web server. Through the web server's firewall, through the firewall, you compromise the web server you're allowed to send HTTP to the web server. This is the point. The firewall looked at the messages and said, you're allowed and sent the attack right into the web server. More recent example is this month's server-side request forgery vulnerability in the Microsoft Exchange web server. Again, lots of people use the web interface to Microsoft email. And again, if you send a specially crafted request into the server, you can read other people's emails, you can write malware into the server, you can, you, you can write over top of normal executable files, you can do all sorts of nasties. And the firewall says, you're allowed to connect to the web port and sends the packets through. You know, in the, in the industrial space, the latest example that springs to mind is the attack on the Israeli water treatment system in the summer of 2020. You know, there were several attacks. One of those attacks found a web HMI connected to the internet without a password with a firewall between the HMI and the internet. And the firewall said, allow connections to the web server. 
So the bad guys connected their browser to the web server. They brought up the HMI you know, visuals. They pressed the buttons and started manipulating the, the, the physical process. The firewall said, you're allowed to connect to the web server. I got a rule that says connections to the web server are allowed. Any questions? You know, a lot of people imagine that firewalls give our business systems, give our businesses access to industrial data while protecting the industrial systems from attack. This is not true. Firewalls fundamentally block certain packets. They forward others. You know, the, the, the firewalls block access to some systems because those packets are blocked and they give us access to other systems so that we can ask those systems for data. Unidirectional gateways push the industrial data out to the, uh, the enterprise where the, the business can profit from it. Nothing gets back into the industrial systems. Unidirectional gateways give business networks access to the industrial data without providing any access to the industrial systems that hold the data. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, command and control beacons. This is a new one. Um, you know, back in the day, we did not see as many targeted attacks as we do today. Today, everything is a targeted attack. It's just amazing. Um, terminology. Uh, targeted attacks are where someone is targeting a particular network manually. A man, an attacker is interactively working their way deeper into a specific target using a rat, a remote access trojan. It's a piece of malware that gives the, uh, the remote attacker remote control uh, of the compromised machine. Uh, it's, when the rat, when that malware gets onto a machine because you clicked an attachment, because you downloaded something injudiciously, whatever, when the rat activates, the first thing it does, it calls home, it phones home. You know, it opens a TCP connection to a command and control server. In, in uh, you know, techno speak, it beacons out to a C2, a command and control server. Uh, you know, the attacker logs into the C2 and looks around and says, well, today I've got 642 connections from my rats, which one shall I pick? And he picks one and uses the rat interactively, command response to attack a particular network. Um, but think about it. If the rat gets into the industrial network, best practice is that the industrial network does not allow connections to hackersarus.com on the internet. The, uh, you know, the rule is denied by default. Um, you allow connections. I mean, there, you might have cloud connections to your, your vendors, to your antivirus vendors, to pull new signatures. You might have you know, cloud connections to the turbine vendors. You might have connections into lots of different vendors' websites. And you've got a rule for each of them in the firewall saying, allow this one, allow that one, allow these. These are known good. Do not allow random connections to hackersarus.com or Google or you know, Gmail or other dangerous services. Only go to specific known good targets where nothing bad is going to come through. That's the theory anyway. Deny by default, deny everything else. Here's the problem. Um, you know, we have these connections to the internet and a lot of these, the modern internet services, the modern websites, I mean, you know, I run three or four websites, every one of them, you know, they used to be running on a machine in my basement here. Every one of them is now on a hosting service. Everybody puts their websites, everybody puts their web applications, you know, in the Amazon cloud or some other hosting service, um, which means, you know, these, these hosting services, they move things around. Uh, you can't use an IP address to get to them anymore. The IP address might change. You have to use a domain name. That's okay. Modern firewalls let you define rules that say, allow connections to star.microsoft.com. You can put a domain name in the rule. How does that resolve? Well. Um, the uh, the DNS resolver, the, the 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 firewall, issues a DNS, you know, a domain name query every once in a while, and gets all of the IP addresses that those domain names translate into, and um, sets up temporary rules, one for each IP address, saying allow this one, allow that. These are all known good IP addresses. So if I'm an attacker and I want to set up a, a, a command and control center and I want rats on industrial networks to call out, where do I put my command and control center? Well, I do my homework. I figure out who's my target. 
I figure out what cloud services they're using. Look at the LinkedIn resumes of employees of my target. Look at uh, conference presentations. There's, there's open source information out there talking about what cloud vendors my target's using. Then go to DNS and figure out what are the IP addresses of those cloud vendors and figure out which hosting services those IP addresses belong to. And go and buy a domain, buy a web server on that same hosting service. Now hackersareus.com, my C2, has the same IP address as you know, the, the industrialcontrolsystem.com, my vendor's web service, my known good web service. It's the same IP address. The firewall can't tell the difference. The firewall sees a, a connect request to that IP address come by and says, well, that's a known good IP address. It's, you know, industrial defender, not industrial, the industrial control system.com. Hacker, you know, it's Microsoft.com, it's Siemens.com. It's, it's a known good IP address. But it's the same IP address as hackersrust.com because I just bought hackersrust.com on the same hosting service with the same IP address as the known good. Now my rat calls through to hackersrust.com and it gets through because I've disguised my web, my malicious website, you know, with a legitimate IP address. Um, Examples, I have not seen reports of this in the wild. You know, maybe it's not surprising yet because, you know, cloud connections aren't yet that common on industrial networks, but they are coming. You know, they're becoming more common every day. And, you know, with the unidirectional gateway, well, the gateways are not routers. They cannot send requests through to the internet. You know, and even if you could somehow magically create a web connection through a unidirectional gateway, no malicious commands from the C2 could get back to activate the rat because the hardware is one way. It's one way out. Nothing can get back. The, the rat would sit there waiting for commands, doing nothing day after day until we finally discovered it someday and cleaned it out. Harmless. Renders, you know, the unidirectional gateway renders rats harmless. Okay. Um, zero day vulnerabilities, any vulnerabilities. I mean, again, this is, you know, fairly similar to the first version of the 13 attacks. What's new? is the examples. What's new is also how simple it's become to exploit vulnerabilities in firewalls. Modern firewalls, they can do everything you can think of. They have gigabytes of memory. They have antivirus servers. They have, they have relational databases running under the hood. Um, you know, they, uh, they have web servers. They, they got everything in, in, in the kitchen sink. So have a look at the, uh, you know, the Sophos uh, 2020 12 271 vulnerability. It's an example of a SQL injection attack on a firewall. What's a SQL injection attack? It's a little string that you set, you, 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 you know, a, a carefully crafted string you stick into the, the login. That's it. It's you know low tech. You can type it with your fingers in you know three minutes. The attack lets you log into the firewall management system without a password. And add a rule that says allow any any. Last year's Sonic Wall 2016 was similarly a SQL injection attack that lets someone without an account steal the usernames and passwords of people who were logged into the firewall's VPN. VPNs are secure, they're encrypted, they use secure communications. Unless someone steals a password, well, then you're sunk. And how hard is it? Well, it's it's a SQL injection attack. Like it's, you know, it's a minute of typing. It's it's you know 89 characters. Um, and uh, you know, if there's a uh, a unidirectional gateway at the ITOT interface instead of a firewall, well, you know, the software in the gateway can have vulnerabilities. Software is software. But if an attacker exploits one of those vulnerabilities, what happens? They get into the software. The hardware is still standing between the unidirectional software and the industrial network. So even if you compromise the software, the hardware saves us. The hardware does not let anything back into the industrial network. This is why the, the, the gateways are stronger than firewalls. This is why people generally put one layer of hardware-based protection between the enterprise network and the industrial network. Uh, here's a new one. 
wasn't in the original 13, you know, a compromised cloud. How does that work? Well, you know, let's start with the, the example here, the, uh, the Oldsmar attack. This was uh, in January, Oldsmar, Florida. Somebody got hold of an old TeamViewer password. TeamViewer was still enabled, but, you know, these folks had moved to a different remote access mechanism, you know, sometime earlier, but they had not yet disabled the team viewer. Someone got hold of the old team viewer password. They logged into the drinking water purification HMI. They moved their mouse. They clicked the button to increase the amount of lie in the drinking water system from a normal setting of about 100 parts per million to a harmful setting of about 11,000 parts per million. They increased the amount of lie a thousand fold. Now, another worker saw this change and went, whoa, and moved the mouse back and set it right back to where it was supposed to be. So no harm was done. And the attacker apparently saw the mouse moving and went, oh, I've been detected and took off. So again, no harm was done. But what's happening under the hood here? The team viewer client on the HMI server connects out to the team viewer cloud. Uh, the team viewer client on the attacker's laptop connects out to the same cloud. The attacker gives the uh, the identifier for the HMI machine and gives the, the, the stolen password, and TeamViewer causes these two connections to rendezvous in the cloud. And so now the attacker has rendezvoused their attack through the TeamViewer cloud back into the industrial network. That's an example of a rendezvous type attack. All of these cloud systems are becoming integrated. It's becoming possible to get into one cloud, jump over to another one, and come back. This is, you know, this is the, the, the way of the future. A slightly more complex attack is where the attacker simply hacks into one cloud vendor. I mean, pick, you know, when I say cloud vendor, don't think hacking into Amazon or hacking into Google. Don't think doing something hard. Think doing something easy. Think there's a small control system vendor out there, they've got a little website and they've proudly stood up their first web-based application. They're charging people for the application. They're delivering value with a cloud-based you know, application. They have entered the world of the industrial internet of things. Their marketing people are abuzz with clouds and industrial internets and edge devices and they're using all these buzzwords. So proud, but they haven't invested much in security. So we compromise their website. We compromise their web application in whatever cloud hosting service is using them. We don't hack into the cloud hosting service, we hack into their application because they haven't secured it very well. We modify the application, we embed, I don't know, ransomware, and we tell the application, push a security update, an emergency security update to all your edge devices, bang, and now you've got ransomware throughout all of the proud, poorly defended vendors. You know. Uh, Industrial, you know, industrial Internet of Things clients. Um, this is bad news. You know, we have seen an example of a rendezvous attack. That's the uh, the team viewer. Um, you know, we're going to see more of these. More and more industrial vendors are deploying cloud-based applications. And you know, if you look, I mean, I, I'm a co-author on the Industrial Internet Consortium Security Framework. You know, there's a lot of vendors talking a lot about encryption. Uh, you know, the framework is full of encryption. But here's the thing, crypto systems encrypt attacks just as happily as they encrypt legitimate communications. Crypto systems protect against man in the middle attacks, not against attacks from compromised endpoints. If we compromise the cloud and send an attack inside an encrypted connection into hundreds of industrial sites at once because they're all connected to the cloud we have used the encryption system to protect our attack as it crosses the internet so you know crypto systems i'm not saying don't use encryption do use encryption but understand the limitations if the endpoint if the cloud is compromised the encryption doesn't save us that's not what encryption is for and if our connection to the cloud is through a unidirectional gateway, we can push data out to the cloud. We can have the cloud analyze the data with big data analytics buzzwords. We can do predictive maintenance. We can do operational effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, we can do all of that, that new neat stuff, that profitable stuff. And even if the cloud is compromised, nothing gets back into the industrial system. We can benefit from the cloud without incurring the risks of cloud connectivity.
Attack number seven is a so-called unidirectional firewall. Now, back in the original 13, I had an attack called firewall configuration mistakes. You know, and it's still possible to make a lot of mistakes configuring firewalls. And you know, today it still does not matter if you make a mistake configuring a unidirectional gateway. Because again, the hardware saves us. Even if the, the software is configured incorrectly, nothing gets back to threaten the industrial network. But you know, I put up this unidirectional firewall thing here because you know, in the last decade, I cannot count the number of times I've heard people make this mistake, this particular mistake. Um, you know, oh, um, what is the mistake? People tell me, yep, that unidirectional stuff, that's, uh, you know, that's good stuff. I use it today. I have a unidirectional firewall. Really, really, I ask, what, what is that? Well, they tell me, you know, my firewall rules only let data out of the industrial network. Nothing gets back. The thing is, there's no such rules. Look at your rules again. Pretty much all firewalls have a rule that says once the connection is set up, allow packets that belong to that connection to go both ways. Allow them in and allow them out. This is the stateful rule. This is the difference between the old style IP address firewalls from 25 years ago and you know the modern stateful firewalls now sometimes the rule is visible if you look at ip tables on linux you can see the rule right there it says connection in progress allow sometimes the rule is invisible but it's still there because all firewalls nowadays are stateful and all stateful firewalls allow bidirectional communication once a connection is established what are the rest of the rules well the rest of the rules most of them talk about um, what who is allowed to open the connection. And if you, you know, the if you look at the rules and they say allow out, allow out, allow out, allow nothing back in, they're allowing you to open the connection out. But once the connection's established, packets can both can go both ways. You know, this is how rats work. They work through these, you know, allegedly unidirectional firewalls. The remote access trojan beacons out to the C2, the firewall allows the connection. And once that connection is done, the C2, it's a TCP connection, the C2 sends commands back into the rat saying, you know, figure out who else is on the network, steal some passwords, steal some, you know, active directory hashes. The commands are coming back on that connection that was opened from the inside out. Um, so that's the example in the wild. All C2 beacons breach allegedly unidirectional firewalls. There is no such thing as a unidirectional firewall. Um, you know, and I'm guessing most of you knew this, but let me mention unidirectional gateways really are unidirectional. Uh, you know, the transmitting hardware, the, the, the circuit board has a laser on it, but no receiver. The receiving hardware has a receiver, but no laser. A short piece of fiber connects the two pieces of hardware. You can send information from the circuit board with a laser into the circuit board with a, with the receiver. It's not physically possible to send anything back because there's no laser on the receiving circuit board. You can't send anything back. Um, you know, so this is this is the difference between you know unidirectional firewalls don't exist. Stateful firewalls allow things to go back and forth. Unidirectional gateways only go one way. It's only physically possible to go one way. Um, another mistake: air gaps. I can't count how many times I've had someone tell me, oh, you know, I have very strong network security. I have an air gap. And then they tell me about their DMZ networks. And I look at their network diagrams and there's firewalls everywhere. And I'm going, excuse me, where's the air gap? And they tell me about their DMZ networks. And they say the firewall on the bottom of the DMZ can only connect and send packets into the DMZ. The firewall on the top of the DMZ lets you know things in the DMZ send messages to the enterprise network. Neither of these networks can send messages directly to the internet. That's my air gap. Guys, you know, that's not an air gap. Um, you know, why not network attacks still get in? No, you can't route packets directly from a C2 straight into the industrial network, but you know, you can daisy chain. Um, 
How does this work? You, you send malicious email, you trick a user into downloading your RAT on the enterprise network. It beacons out to the C2 because the enterprise network is allowed to talk to the internet. The bad guys get in, they start looking around, they attack the next level down, they plant a copy of their RAT into the DMZ through the first layer of firewall. But they configure the RAT so that when it lands, it does not try to beacon out to the C2, it beacons out to the RAT on the enterprise network. And that rat daisy chains the packets out to the internet. And now the attacker can send their commands into the enterprise rat, into the DMZ rat, and attack systems in the DMZ and find their way through to the industrial network and plant a rat there and daisy chain it back to the DMZ and daisy chain it back to the enterprise and daisy chain it back to the C2. Proof of this, you know, have a look at Metasploit. Metasploit's been around a long time. It's a powerful attack tool. It's a demonstration tool. It's a tool that penetration testers legitimately use to demonstrate you know, how to attack things. Daisy chaining is a standard feature in Metasploit. It's a standard feature in all of the professional grade attack tools, both the ones the good guys use and the ones the bad guys use. Um, a unidirectional gateway, it lets the data out, it lets nothing back in. A unidirectional gateway protects the control system as thoroughly as an air gap would have, while still letting the enterprise profit from access to the industrial data. The gateway lets us have our cake and eat it too. Now, I'm going to take an aside here, another pet peeve of mine. There's people out there saying, oh, you know, there's no such thing as an air gap. After all, data can still move on USB sticks. This is revisionist history. Go back and look at how air, back was, air gaps were, were the, how the term was defined in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. An air gap network is a network with no online connection to any external network. USB drives are offline connections. Even in the old days, we could carry information into air gap networks on floppy drives, on, on tapes. You know, the people who poo-poo air gaps are doing a disservice, not just to history, but to security. Air gaps are powerful tools for securing the smallest sites, the poorest sites, the sites that can't afford, you know, a, an IEC 62443 compliant security system. Think small water treatment sites. We all want our water to be clean, but these small sites don't have any money for security. They can use tools like air gaps. They're dirt cheap. They're very powerful if you use them right. I'm, I'm writing a white paper on this. So it, it, it really bugs me when people start complaining about how air gaps aren't really air gaps and confusing the people who know the least about security and who most urgently need to use air gaps to protect our drinking water systems. Uh, break the VPN, you know, this is another case of, well, it's encrypted, so it must be, you know, it must be secure. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's ways through VPNs, there's ways to break VPNs, you know. Um, the, the obvious is, look, when, when someone gives me personally a VPN password, it's because they trust me. But when I give the password to my computer, it's not me who's getting into the network that the VPN is connecting me to. It's my laptop that's connected to that network. You know, you may trust me. You may give me the password. Should you trust my laptop? What kind of nasty is on my laptop? Who knows? So attacks can jump from compromised equipment through VPNs. And VPNs are software. VPNs have holes. You know, look at uh, in 2018, uh, 13379 was a Fortinet hole. Um, again, you know, attackers could um, steal uh, usernames and passwords from Fortinet VPN servers. In 2019, you know, uh, 11510 was for the Pulse Secure VPN server. Same consequence, uh, uh, you know, attackers without accounts are allowed to log or to attack the, the VPN and steal passwords for users who are logged in already. Uh, attack number 10, you know, break the artificial intelligence. A lot of the high-end firewalls, they have built-in intrusion detection systems. These are called, you know, anomaly-based systems. These systems use machine learning. They use artificial intelligence. They learn what's normal. They learn what is going on, what, what should be going on in the network, and they raise alarms if anything changes materially. How do you break an AI? You either go low and slow or you go fast and hard. Low and slow means you attack in tiny steps, slowly, 
a little attack here, a little attack there. The AI sees these tiny deviations going on over and over and learns that this appears normal. You know, they might issue the 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 of uh, their very lowest priority uh, alert the first time they see a, you know this deviation, but then it just keeps happening, and they eventually go, you know, these tiny these these low priority alerts they're not worth issuing. This seems to be normal, and then you attack a little bit more low and slow. You occasionally get a low priority alert that everyone ignores, and event you know over time you increase the severity of your attack, and the AI learns that this is normal and never issues a high priority alarm. The opposite is possible as well. Um, you know, some of the, the targeted ransomware attacks on industrial control systems in 2020, they went from the rat lands to ransomware everywhere in 45 minutes, faster than human uh, you know, security analysts can recognize the attack, can recognize it as a real thing, even if there's, you know, if there's if there's high priority alarms everywhere, faster than incident response teams can be scrambled to deal with the attack. It just happens too fast. Both ways get past AIs. Both ways do get past AIs. Every targeted attack that succeeds on a firewall with this AI stuff in it has broken the AI one way or another. This is how it works. Um, you know, what's the bottom line? Don't get me wrong. I have nothing against intrusion detection, you know, not a long, not anomaly based, not signature based. I, you know, you need to measure your security. Just don't confuse detection and response with prevention. And Neuberger, the uh, deputy assistant for cybersecurity to the, uh, the, the, the US president, uh, spoke on industrial security at a SANS conference a couple of weeks ago. Her quote is on the bottom here. The URL is on the bottom there as well, if you want it. Um, she says, we have to shift our mindset from incident response to prevention. This is the nature of industrial cybersecurity. You know, by the time the incident response teams get there, a lot of the time, the damage has already been done. Um, so another side trip here, you know, targeted ransomware, I've mentioned a couple of times, it's something that a lot of people are worried about. It's not one of the 13 attacks. Uh, you know, I did a cyber, uh, sorry, I did a, a cyber, I looked at cyber attacks in 2020, uh, attacks with physical consequences, attacks that shut down industrial operations. There were nine public disclosures of this kind of attack. Every one of them was targeted ransomware. These targeted attacks, uh, you know, each of them punched through several layers of firewalls, each of these attacks. Uh, each of these attacks got past any intrusion detection system that was deployed. A lot of these attacks are really very sophisticated. Today's targeted ransomware groups, a lot of them are using the same tools and attack techniques that nation state actors used only four or five years ago. You know, and I can't, I can't count how many times I've heard someone say, oh, but why would a nation state come after me? I'm not important enough to be a nation state target. Well, today the question is not if we're important enough. The organized crime groups don't care if you're important. They're going after anybody with money. If we have money, we are targets. Um, supply chain attacks. This is something a lot of people have been talking about very recently. I mean, you know, we trust our vendors. Should we trust their security updates? Uh, Solar winds is what everyone's talking about. There's been others, not Petya was was a malware embedded in an automatic update for a Ukrainian tax program. You know, NotPetya pretended to be ransomware, but really just destroyed everything. NotPetya crippled a whole bunch of industrial enterprises for days. You can Google it. The lawsuits are still underway. Billions of dollars in lawsuits for cyber insurance claims that have not been paid out because not Petya was flagged as a nation state attack because the Russians were allegedly behind it. You know, that same year, there was a, a different attack embedded in a software update for the CCleaner software. The good news is the attack was discovered and the C2 was shut down before any damage was done. But, you know, supply chain attacks are not new and they are nasty. And, uh, you know, common wisdom is that when security updates come out, we should install them everywhere as fast as humanly possible. Firewalls don't stop security updates. They come in over encrypted, authenticated connections. Unidirectional gateways can't stop something coming through on a USB either. 
And, you know, as I explained earlier, if the attackers are clever, you know, the supply chain rats can beacon out through firewalls, unidirectional firewalls and otherwise. That beaconing won't work through a unidirectional gateway. Um, coming up on the end here, let's look at a cell phone Wi-Fi attack. This one's new. Cell phones are walking wireless attack vectors. The AndroRat example here started out life as a proof of concept that let researchers show how easy it was to insert malware into legitimate Android apps. Well, that proof of concept's been weaponized. It's been used by real attackers. They've dropped their malware somehow into you know, probably a supply chain thing again, into dozens, you know, a little less than 100 uh, real Android apps. Um, and, you know, so here's the attack. Uh, imagine that, you know, an attacker is using Andro Rat and has embedded their malware into a bunch of popular Android apps and has infected hundreds of thousands of cell phones. Um, what does the, the, the stuff do? It, you know, when you carry a cell phone into an industrial site, uh, nobody connects the cell phone to Wi-Fi on the industrial networks. Nobody does that, you know, that's just a bad idea. So the Wi-Fi subsystem in the cell phone is idle. And so the, uh, the bad stuff, the malware, uses the Wi-Fi subsystem to scan for Wi-Fi access points and report their GPS location over the, the cell phone data connection to the command and control center on the internet. Now, when someone wants to target a specific industrial site with a ransomware attack or with something else, what they do is they go to their database and say, where is the site physically? Which of my GPS locations are inside that site? Here are the, uh, the, the Wi-Fi networks in the site. Use spear phishing attacks, invest a little bit of effort, harvest the credentials to log into those networks. And now the next time anybody carries any compromised cell phone, not the original, any compromised cell phone into the site, the bad guys can reach through the command and control center through the internet into the cell phone over the data connection and instruct it to connect to the, the, the industrial Wi-Fi using the stolen credentials. And now it can attack the industrial network through the cell phone. You know, um, I've written uh, a couple of books. My latest book, Secure Operations Technology, is not about me, it's not about waterfall, it's about what the world's most secure industrial sites do differently. And one thing they do is use unidirectional gateways, yes. Another thing is that these sites are deeply suspicious of wireless networks. And it's because of these kinds of vulnerabilities. This attack is one of the reasons these sites distrust wireless networks so very much. Sometimes they're forced to use them because there just isn't any other way. But if there's another way, they don't use wireless networks because it's very hard to mitigate this kind of attack on a wireless network. You know, my last attack here, sneaker net, all information flows are attacks. Firewalls let online attacks into industrial targets. But USB drives and laptops and even brand new computers are offline ways to carry information and potentially attacks into industrial networks. Uh, the Ramsey attack uh, this year, Google it, it's in the wild. This is the real thing. It steals information from air gap computers using USB drives. The assumed target is, you know, government and classified military networks, but, you know, the, it's it's a, a very sophisticated USB attack. And again, SecoT users are deeply suspicious of USB drives as well, and generally just forbid them outright on the industrial network. If you've got to carry information into the industrial network, it's got to come in on a, uh, a CD or a DVD, a write once DVD, not a USB drive. So that's what I had for you. Um, you know, if you'd like to dig deeper, um, here's a couple of resources. You can buy my book on Amazon or Go to, water, go to the Waterfall website slash sec-ot and ask for a copy. Waterfall still has an inventory of the things that we're giving away as a public service. The book's not about Waterfall. It's about what the world's most secure sites do differently. Waterfall sponsors the Industrial Security Podcast, where I'm one of the co-hosts. Again, the podcast is not about Waterfall. It's about industrial security. The podcast is free. Every episode has a different guest talking about their perspective 
on the elephant that is industrial security. You can find the podcast on your favorite cell phone, go to the podcast app and search for industrial security. Um, there's also, you know, fairly new, the Industrial Security Institute, it's our newest effort. Um, it's a series of 10 to 15 minute videos that we release about every two weeks. You know, we try to make them interesting. We try to make them, uh, you know, maybe even a little amusing. Um, and uh, they're on YouTube, search for Waterfall Security, one of the playlists is the Industrial Security Institute. We're currently going through 20 episodes on the top 20 cyber attacks on industrial control systems, one attack for every episode. And all of this is under the resources menu on the Waterfall website if you want to look at that, you know, all of this and even more. Um, a few words about Waterfall and uh, let's wrap up. Um, you know, Waterfall is the, the OT security company. We produce, we sell unidirectional security gateways. We sell a whole family of products for that matter, products that are either based on the gateways or that complement the gateways. You know, we're installed worldwide in an enormous variety of industries. So the bottom line, you know, wrap it up, summarize. We covered 13 ways. Fundamentally, firewalls have a couple of problems. Fundamentally, firewalls are software and all software can be hacked. This is intrinsic. This will never go away. And firewalls are routers. So they forward attack packets and other packets right into the very systems that we need protected most. Now, don't get me wrong. A reminder, firewalls have a role inside industrial networks. They have a role in the enterprise networks, but they're generally the wrong solution at the ITOT interface where the control critical networks meet the business critical networks. All this is why the US Department of Homeland Security and the National Security Agency and NIST and NISA and lots of other authorities have been recommending and sometimes even requiring the use of unidirectional gateways at this boundary between the critical and non-critical networks. Again, I'm Andrew Ginter. My email's on the bottom here. If you have feedback, if you have questions, if you have criticism, please drop me a note. I'm on LinkedIn with that email as well. Good, bad, or ugly, we can only get better if we get feedback. So let us know if, you know, let me know if, uh, you know, this kind of material has been useful to you. That's what I had. Thanks for staying with me. Uh, Mike, have we got any, uh, any questions backed up? Of course we've got questions. You knew that was coming. Uh <laughs> Yeah, well, I thank you. I mean, this yeah. was great stuff, and you know, we we do actually have a lot of good questions coming in, and to the audience, please do keep them coming. I'm not sure we're going to get to all of the questions uh, that in the time we have, but we're going to try, and uh, we'll follow up uh, with individually as necessary to make sure that your question does get answered. So. Um, one of the we, we've got a couple coming in about technology, and uh, you know people asking, is this better? Is that better? Uh, one of the first questions that came in was, well, it, it, is a proxy server a better choice than a firewall when we're looking to control this cloud access? Uh, that's a good question. Um, The uh, so you know what's the difference between a a proxy server and a firewall? Um, when the firewall sees a connect request come through to uh, you know something out in the internet, the uh, the connect request is a TCP SYN packet. It's an an internet protocol packet. It has you know a source address, a source port, a destination address, a destination port. Um, the uh, but the, you know, all, it see, all that the firewall sees is the IP addresses, which is why the DNS rules have to be translated into IP addresses. A proxy server is a program that sits between the web clients and the web servers, and it gets the connection, and it actually gets the entire request, and it looks at the request. And inside the request is the name of the host that is the target of the request. And so proxy servers, in a sense, have more information at their disposal than firewalls. And so, yes. Um, best practice in the enterprise world is if you want to um, control connections to web services, you uh, you do it with a proxy server because the proxy server can say even if the web if three web services have the same address, this one is going to Microsoft.com. It's allowed. This one is going to Siemens.com. It's allowed. That was going to HackersRust.com. I have no idea what that is. Drop it. Don't allow it. Only allow stuff to known good uh, websites. Um, 
So the proxy server gives you more power that way. Um, here's the problem. Um, the web is evolving. You know, this, the feedback I'm getting from, from IT gurus is uh, the web is evolving. Um, more and more services are using, more and more things are using cloud services. So concrete example, the most recent, and I forget the name of it, the most recent um, Microsoft integrated security package does a lot of stuff in the cloud. And uh, if you have uh, a, a business with 10,000 Microsoft you know, laptops and desktops and servers in the business, now every one of them connects out to the cloud on a regular basis, going to the, you know, the, the, the apparently websites, you know, port 80, port 443, all of these modern cloud services, they do all of their interactions through port 80 and port 443, just like a normal website would. They're indistinguishable. Um, and the problem is that there's over a hundred of these websites, of these domain names, that the average machine is connecting to. This is the advice from Microsoft is configure your, your proxy server to allow all that. Well, I'm getting feedback that people are doing that and their proxy servers are just overwhelmed with the volume of requests that are going through. And when they call up Microsoft to complain, Microsoft says, oh yes, um, we recommend that you don't actually go through the proxy server, send those requests straight through your firewall, use a DNS rule. So you can't use the proxy server, it's overwhelmed with these, what, these cloud intensive applications that are emerging. You have to go through the firewall and now you're stuck with the, you know, I can impersonate Microsoft or Siemens or whoever by purchasing a malicious web application, a malicious website on the same hosting service as the legitimate website. So in theory, a proxy server is supposed to help you. In practice, um, it's falling apart. And it's because the people who design these cloud services aren't talking to the people who design the clouds, aren't talking to the security people in the enterprises that have to use these things. Because you know, the, the, uh, you know, the efficiencies of the cloud are there, but the design of the system is such that you can't secure it properly. And so we wind up with these, these holes in our firewalls, in our, you know, the holes that let the rats beacon out to their C2s, you know, in spite of our best efforts. So that's a complicated answer, but you know, I, I hope I got the point across. That's great. Uh, we've got another uh, question about the, the technology that can, uh, Compete with the firewalls here, and uh, somebody wants to know: Does EAL certification does it provide enough confidence uh, uh, about uh, data diode uh, security for or a vendor and their ability to provide a secure device? Um, that's a good question, and EAL certification is tricky. Um, you know, a lot of people wave it around and say, we're EAL certified, EAL2, EAL4, EAL7, whatever. Um, EAL is common criteria. Common criteria is a, a military grade uh, kind of security certification. But intrinsically, what is common criteria? Do, you know, does the, the, does the security lab look at the, at the, the system and say, well, it, uh, it's secure, so we'll give it a certain, that's not what happens. With common criteria, the vendor has to um, has to uh, submit to the certification authority documentation and you know but the vendor has to submit claims and the certification authority tests the product and the design of the product against the vendor claims so when you see that a firewall is eal certified you've got to go ask what did the vendor claim and you know, vendor claims can be strong or they can be weak. So you know, when you look at at uh, the firewall, it says you know the vendor claims that the firewall uh, does what the rules permit and permits nothing else. Okay, so you can test against that claim. Let's say you get that claim certified to EAL two, which is a reasonably high degree of confidence. EAL four is higher. EAL seven is even higher. You've got some degree of confidence that the firewall will only do what the rules say it should do, 
and will do nothing else. I mean, fundamentally, this is the difference between reliable and secure. Something is reliable if it does what it's supposed to do every time it's supposed to do it. Something is secure if it only does what it's supposed to do and nothing else. And so what you're verifying is, fine, the, the, you know, does the security device do what the rules say it should do and does it do nothing else? Um, so look at the claims very carefully. And, but even if, even if you certify that a firewall does what the rules say it does and does nothing else, the rules let some of the attacks through. This is the whole point. Go through the 13 ways, you know, guessing a password, the firewall won't help you, even if it's EAL certified. Um, you know, a, a buffer overflow vulnerability won't help you. Okay, the certificate authority does not uh, verify that the software can never have vulnerabilities. It's verifying something else. Look very carefully at what claim it's verifying. So yes, EAL means something, but you've got to look carefully at the claim. So by contrast, you know, uh, waterfall unidirectional gateways are common criteria certified, EAL certified. What's the claim waterfall made for the unidirectional gateways? The claim was it is truly one way, nothing ever gets back. And the certificate authority looked at the implementation, looked at the design and said, yes, to a very high de degree of confidence in the face of even the most sophisticated imaginable possible attacks, this hardware setup, when set up the way the vendor recommends, and we had some recommendations, when set up the way the, rec the, the vendor recommends, nothing will get back ever with a very high degree of confidence. So look carefully at the claims and look carefully at the attacks and understand, even if the claims are true, which of these attacks will still get through? That's great advice. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so I'm going to bump this one up because uh, it's uh, asking for a clarification about uh, technology you were explaining earlier. Uh, someone is asking if enterprise clients need to initiate, the enterprise clients need to initiate data requests to ICS historians. How is this possible if enterprise clients can't reach the historians? Good question. So uh, this happens all the time. Waterfall works with almost all of the, the, the historian vendors. Um, what we do is we need a historian set up, uh, obviously inside the industrial network. This is where the historian gathers its data. We also need an enterprise historian. Um, this is a very common design, you know, um, there's, a, there's a, a local historian in the plant and it forwards data out to the enterprise historian. Um, we put the unidirectional gateway between the two historians and uh, the, the gateway software logs into the, the industrial historian, uh, asks the historian for all the latest data, builds up a snapshot of the latest data, pushes the snapshot out through the strange one-way hardware and updates the enterprise historian with the latest industrial data. Anybody who needs the data can ask for it from the enterprise historian. They get the same answer from the enterprise historian as they would have had from the industrial historian. And so uh, you get real-time access to industrial data all over the enterprise without ever getting real, any kind of access to the industrial systems that produce the data. That's sort of one very common scenario. A second scenario says, look, I don't want two historians, I only want one historian. So put the historian on the enterprise network. But where does the historian get its data? It gets it from Modbus or S7 or you know Allen Bradley Data Highway or OPC or you name it, you know, data sources. Put the gateway between the data source and the historian. Have the gateway connect to those data sources, ask them for data on a regular basis, build up a snapshot of that industrial data, push the snapshot through the weird one-way hardware, and on the outside, pretend to be those data sources. If it's OPC on the inside, it's OPC on the outside. If it's S7 on the inside, it's S7 on the outside. And now the historian pulls the unidirectional gateway software and gets the same answer from those emulated devices as it would have got from the live devices. And so again, the enterprise has access to the data. The queries go to the enterprise historian. Nothing needs to get back into the industrial database 
all of the data is available in, in a sense, the original systems, the original formats on the enterprise network. So I, I hope that makes sense. Absolutely, thank you. Um, this one uh, is interesting. Um, uh, we've got a question starting with a statement that uh, this person is boiling down a network, uh, the definition of a network uh, to assets that have a perceived value, sensors for monitoring, and controls for prevention. And the question is, is there uh, any uh, database that you're aware of that would catalog those properties uh, relative uh, level uh, to each other, presumably. For example, the relative strength of a firewall to prevent an attack, if a firewall could even be considered prevention. Um, the, uh, the short answer is no, I'm not aware of such a database um, you might look at do some googling or contact epri you might look at the epri there's an epri risk assessment methodology send me an email i can i can uh, i can send you a follow-up but the the epri methodology um they they uh, they develop data sheets for every one of your assets for your firewalls for your active directory servers for your historians and these data sheets describe in some detail um, how the system works how the data flows work because every data flow can also be an attack vector um, you know what kinds of files are created it's a very detailed description of these things and talks about um, potential attack vectors how can you attack these systems and these things are intended to be produced uh, you know, ideally by the vendors. So you've got a database of this information from the vendors. And now you can, when you're combining uh, individual systems into a solution, you can look at these descriptions of the individual systems and combine them and say, well, when I combine these two this way, this problem goes away because it's just not exposed anymore. Um, when I add this thing on top, it compensates for that problem and these problems go away. And you wind up with ideally a smaller set of security vulnerabilities for the over, over the overarching system reflecting the the design of the system reflecting the security controls you put in place so it's uh it's uh it's an idea that is being talked about uh, like i said epri's done some work on it um but uh i'm not i don't know how populated that database is i don't know yet how popular that kind of system is it's certainly not comprehensive but I've heard some vendors, OSI Soft has done some very good work on uh, the data sheets that that would you know help to populate that database. EPRI has done some work on sort of the generic data sheets for a bunch of the the, the standard Microsoft operating systems and products. Um, you, you might give them a call and and see if that you know if that helps. Or like I said, uh, send me an email and I can get you in touch with the the, the right folks there. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple people uh, coming back and saying, hey, I've got another one for you. Um, you know, how about just using the remote access that the firewall already permits, like the RDP in the, in the Ukraine attacks or uh, a network address translation and that slipstream attack. So, you know, that, that's two of the ones that have been mentioned here in the Q&A. So, you know, are these other way through another way through the firewall and isn't that kind of the point that you were trying to make here today it is so yeah there's other ways through the firewall like i said i've i dropped some of the attacks in the original 13 list not because they don't work anymore i dropped them because they're just not popular anymore because they're you know because there's other stuff that's sort of top of mind so yeah whatever's top of your mind um it's uh um you're going to have sort of a different, in a sense, this isn't 13 ways, this is the top 13. This is what what's top of my mind when I think about ways to get through a firewall. There's lots of ways through a firewall. Um, yeah, the, I, I, uh, the, the, the slipstream attack is something that I've only recently become aware of. You know, Clever, uh, you know, uses the, uh, uh, you know, facilities that were put into firewalls decades ago for the, the, you know, the horrible old FTP protocol that nobody's supposed to be using anymore. But you know, let's attacks through now, you know, 
very bad idea. So yeah, um, there's lots of ways through a firewall. If you'd like a uh, sort of you know, different view of industrial attacks, not just on firewalls, uh, you know, Google top 20 attacks on industrial control systems, or go to the Waterfall website uh, under resources, under eBooks, and you'll see it under there. Uh, you know, it's also chapters um, 10 through 12 in the Black Book, but it's a different look at, you know, here's a, a spectrum of attacks across a, a spectrum of sophistication, a spectrum of consequence that you can use to say, well, you know, if I ran one of these against my system, how would I fare? Which of these would I survive? Which of these would I not? Um, because that's one way of getting a sense of how secure are you, you know, how much trouble are we really in? And I think that is a fantastic place to uh, cut it off uh, for now. We could go for hours, but I want to say thank you again, Andrew. This was really great, very informative. And, and thank you to everybody else who has joined us for this webinar. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we will get a follow-up email out to everybody, to all registrants that will include information on how to access a recorded version of this webinar, as well as links to all the relevant information and registration information related upcoming webinars. Um, please do continue to visit the website, uh, waterfall-security.com for all of the latest information about waterfall security solutions, as well as you know, the latest information in the field of OT security. Uh, thank you all for your time today, and I'll turn it back to Andrew for the final word. I just want to say thank you, Michael, for organizing all this, and thank you, everyone, for staying with us. And uh, remind you, you know, uh, andrew.ginter at waterfall-security.com. Uh, give me feedback, or if you have questions, follow up, and, you know, I'll try and point you at uh, what data sources I'm aware of. Thank you so much. We'll catch you next time.